Hi, this is David Wood with Act 17. Over the past couple of months, we've received several requests from our Muslim friends to answer the question, how can God die? We heard this objection at the festival from our friend Hakim and from others. Then just last week, a young Muslim named Ali sent us a YouTube request with the same question. Stated in its full force, the objection would go something like this. Christians believe that Jesus is God, and Christians believe that Jesus died. So Christians believe that God died. But God is eternal and unchanging and all-powerful. What sense does it make to say that he died? If you're not clear on what Christians believe, this is a perfectly reasonable question to ask. In fact, Nabil and I get excited when Muslims ask questions like this because it gives us an opportunity to clarify the gospel. And clarification is crucial because very few Muslims understand the gospel. In this video, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to state the Christian view so that everyone knows what we're claiming. Second, I'm going to try to help Muslims understand our view by drawing attention to certain Muslim beliefs. And finally, I'm going to show why the Christian view has to be correct and why the Muslim view has to be false. In the first verse of the book of John, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was in the beginning, before anything was created. Verse 3 says that everything was created through the Word. The Word was with God, indicating that there's a distinction in the Godhead, later to be fully clarified as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Word was God, indicating that the Word was, by nature, in essence, God. Verse 14 goes on to say that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is referring, of course, to Jesus. So Christians aren't saying that God, as he is in himself, eternal and incorruptible, died one day. The Christian claim is that the second person of the Trinity, who is God, entered into creation, taking on human flesh, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's what Christians are claiming. So how can a Muslim maintain that our view is somehow incoherent? Here, our Muslim friends might say that God can't enter into his creation, but as a Muslim, you shouldn't say this. In fact, if you say that God can't enter into his creation, you're contradicting the Quran. In Surah 27, 7 through 9, we read, Call to mind when Moses said to his family, I perceive a fire. I will bring you from there some news of great import, or I will bring you a flaming brand that you may warm yourselves. So when he came to it, he was called by a voice, Blessed is he who is in the fire and also those around it. And glorified be Allah, the Lord of the worlds. O Moses, verily I am Allah, the mighty, the wise. So the voice says, blessed is he who is in the fire. And Allah speaks out of the fire. Who's the blessed one in the fire? Allah. If Allah can enter into his creation and speak out of a fire, can't he enter into his creation and speak out of human flesh? The correct Muslim answer is, yes, of course, God can do that. He's all-powerful. Christians and Muslims then have to agree that God can enter into his creation. But perhaps a Muslim will say here, okay, God can enter into his creation, but if he does, how can he die? Good question. In response, let me illustrate by pointing out what Muslims believe about the Quran. This is a Quran. This Quran, according to Islam, has two natures. On the one hand, as the eternal word of Allah, it has no beginning, it was not created, it cannot be destroyed. On the other hand, this Quran is made of paper and ink and glue. These are physical materials. Now, on September 11th, a church in Florida is apparently hosting Burn the Quran Day. Ali, one of the young Muslims who asked us to explain how God can die, also asked what we think about Burn the Quran Day. For the record, Ali, I think it's ridiculous and idiotic, and I can guarantee that Nabil feels the same way. You can quote me on that. But it does raise an interesting question for purposes of this discussion. Muslims ask, how can God die? As if this somehow refutes the Christian view. But let me ask, how can the eternal word of Allah be burned? The correct Muslim response here is this. David, as Muslims, we're not saying that when someone burns the Quran, Allah's eternal word is destroyed. No, when someone burns the Quran, the paper and ink and glue that make up the physical nature of that Quran are destroyed. But the eternal nature of the Quran remains unchanged. Interesting. Let me see if I understand. 
the eternal word of Allah, which is uncreated and indestructible, enters our world as a physical Quran, which is created and can be destroyed. If this Quran is destroyed, Muslims won't say that Allah's eternal word is destroyed. They'll simply say that the Quran has two natures, an eternal nature and a physical nature, and that it's the physical nature that can be destroyed by burning. But how is this so very different from the Christian claim that the Divine Son, the eternal Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us, that he entered into his creation as Jesus of Nazareth, and that once he had taken on human flesh, his physical nature, since it was created and perishable, was capable of dying, even though his divine nature could not die? My Muslim friends, if you say it's a problem for God to take on a physical form, which can be killed, why wouldn't you say that it's also a problem for the eternal word of Allah to take on a physical form which can be burned? This seems like an inconsistency to me. Please clarify your position, if you can. Until I get a good response here, I can only conclude that Christians and Muslims have to agree that God has the power to enter his creation as a human being, and that if he does, his human body will be capable of dying. But if we have to agree on this point, why are Muslims so confused by the Christian claim that Jesus is God and that Jesus died on the cross. The real confusion on this issue comes from Islamic theology. You see, in Islam it makes no sense for Allah to enter his creation to die for sins because Allah's justice, love, and mercy are all limited and imperfect. For instance, what does the Quran say about Allah's love? Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner. Allah does not love the unbelievers. Allah does not love the unjust. Allah does not love him who is proud, boastful. Allah does not love the extravagant. Allah does not love the treacherous. Allah does not love the mischief makers. Allah does not love any arrogant boaster. The God of Islam only seems to love good Muslims. Allah has no love for rebellious sinners or unbelievers. So would a God who doesn't love sinners enter into the world to die for sinners? Of course not. The God of the Quran wouldn't do that because he just doesn't care about people that much. This is the real reason Muslims can't grasp the incarnation and sacrificial death of Jesus. I should also point out that Allah's justice is limited and flawed. According to Islam, if Allah wants to forgive you, he can just sweep your sins under the rug, pretend they never happened. That may be merciful, but it's not just. Islam teaches that at the end of time, there will be unpunished sin. That means that Allah's justice isn't perfect. He's going to let some sin slide. Now, how does this compare with the one true God? Well, the God of the Bible is perfect in his attributes. God's love and mercy are perfect. God loves sinners so much that he entered into creation in order to pay the price for our sins. Romans 5, 6 to 8 says that while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice also that at the end of time, all sin is punished in Christianity. Either you pay for your own sin, or you're forgiven, in which case Jesus himself takes the penalty. Since the God of the Bible punishes all sins, his justice is perfect. Now, I know that this is difficult for Muslims to grasp. They can't comprehend a God who would love people so much that he would lay aside his glory, enter into his creation, and pay the price for our sins. But let me ask you this. My Muslim friends, suppose you were king of the world, dressed in royal robes. One day your servants are carrying you around when you look over and see that your child is drowning in a pool of mud. Wouldn't you throw your robes aside and dive right into that mud to save the child you love? Would it matter to you that you're king of the world? No. All that would matter is your child. If that's how great your love is, how much greater do you think God's love is? Enough to enter creation and die for us? That's the God I'm proclaiming to you. Muslims bring up these objections to show Christians that there's something wrong with our view of God. But as soon as we dig a little deeper, we find that the Muslim view insults and degrades God by limiting his attributes, while the Christian view honors God by displaying his perfection. 
one definition of God is this. God is the greatest possible being, the greatest conceivable being. So if I can think of a being greater than your God, you're not really worshiping God. I can easily think of a being greater than the God of the Quran. In fact, in at least one way, I'm greater than the God of the Quran. I love unbelievers. Allah doesn't. So my love is greater than Allah's. Of course, my love is nothing compared to the love of the God of the Bible, who demonstrated his love to us and confirmed his message by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And now he commands all people to repent and believe the gospel. Please don't continue ignoring him, my Muslim friends.